rated M for mature. We've got one of the announcers. He uh, took time out of his very busy schedule. Mr. Greg Proops, say hello to uh, all our fans. Hello, everybody. Hi, I'm Greg Proops. Hi, JP. <laughs> or uh, as we called you in Mad World, Howard Buckshot Holmes. Buckshot, yeah. So uh, I kind of want to start and find out how you got involved with Mad World. Um, what happened? Uh, my friend Jack Fletcher called me, who I'd done a bunch of pictures with, uh, a wildly unsuccessful picture called Kyena the Prophecy that had Kristen Dunst and uh, Richard Harris' last movie. I think it was the movie that took his life. And uh, Angelica Houston. And I, I did that picture with him and a, a few, an asterisk versus the Vikings, another wildly unsuccessful picture. Uh, animated films. And um, I've known Jack for years. I, I, I'm from San Francisco and so is he. And he still lives there. Mm -hmm. And he asked me to do it. And uh, then when he told me John was doing it, I was very excited because uh, John's such a great uh, talent. Yeah, John, I, we'd never met before. So. And John, unfortunately, couldn't be here today. We had an offer in and it almost worked out. But he... Uh, He's rehearsing for something this evening. So, oh, is he? Yeah, so we couldn't uh, get the uh, the timings to work out. I would have thought that a bar was open somewhere in Los Angeles. <laughs> yeah, uh, bender on a bender. Oh, buddy. So, uh, did you have to audition at all for it? Or? Not really, no. We came in, and they, uh, I, I, I can't remember the very beginning one, but I, I think we just came in and, and jumped right in. Uh, and, and the parts were set from the very start, because I, uh, I did the uh, pod race announcer in the picture... Um, uh, the Phantom Menace, yeah. uh, which is, I think, the f Star Wars 4. No, Episode 1. It's yeah. Episode 1, but it's the fourth picture in the uh, Bingeology. And yeah. uh, so uh, I I, did, I was going to be the announcer, and John was always going to be the color guy. And uh, when you got into the studio, um, before like you got into the studio, did you have any idea what kind of material you were going to be working on? I didn't. I didn't realize that it was going to be uh, as... as um, frank and profane and adult as it was. Uh, I thought, you know, I've done video games before uh, over the last 10, 15 years from the dawn of video games. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think I'm the announcer on Pod Racer, you know, the Star Wars one, and yeah, yeah. there's a game called, um, oh golly, I've forgotten the name of it. It's, Sylvester Stallone did a horrible car racing movie in the 90s, and I, I, I did the video game of that as well. Oh, really? Uh, yes. If I could remember the name of it, I'd tell I'm, you. I'm, I'm racking my brain. I'm yeah, well, to think of it one, of your, one of the people out there will know which which car racing movie Sylvester Stallone did it. And so having done those and, and really early ones like Pandemonium and stuff like that that are... Uh, Pandemonium was actually a pretty decent game though. Mm. I mean, I enjoyed it really, but it was, it was decent. I mean, I'm the jester in that one, and uh, so no, I wasn't ready for uh, exactly <laughs> how uh, how wild we were going to get. Uh, I didn't know you could do, you know, hooker jokes and thing jokes, and you know, yeah. the kind of the kind of material we got into. So, what was the reaction when you and John get into the studio and they hand you those pieces of paper, and you're like, what, what? Yeah, well, you know. Yeah, John is hilarious, uh, first of all, and we really made each other laugh. So uh, it was a little bit of a mutual admiration society. Um, and, and, and then, of course, we'd crack up all the time and break and then end up everything that we'd break with. with the, He started going, I blame our schools, like that. And the, that became the catchphrase through no matter what vile thing we said. Yeah. Oh, that reminds me of when I was standing there. One after the next and you know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And then it would be, I blame our schools. So... Uh, once we got into the spirit of the thing, uh, we were able to take it a little even further, I think, than the writers intended it to. Did you do a lot of ad-libbing? Well, I don't want to take anything away from the writers, but we did a, we did a fair amount of ad-libbing. What got in, I'm not certain of, because I haven't watched the game yet. I don't have a Wii uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, operating system. Yeah. Uh, I have a steam-powered, you know, Ms. Pac-Man, so uh, I, I have the game, but I haven't watched it yet. Oh, you, you have to get a Wii. I know. Yeah, and then, uh, you know, hire, like, some kid down the street to play it for you. Yes, I'll... So you, I, can just, you can just kind of sit back on the couch and enjoy your own work. Exactly. I, I, I'm on a Nickelodeon show, um, which they would be mortified at the content of this game because Nickelodeon is very straight. Yeah, well, did they know that you were doing it? Or? I haven't told anybody there, but everyone's come up to me on the set of this Nickelodeon show because they've been running the ad on Spike and uh, 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 TNT yeah. during the basketball playoffs. Uh, there's an ad where at the very end there's a tag from Mad World uh, where I go yeah. come back with Jack. And so everybody's yeah. recognized my voice. And uh, there's a kid on the set, he's, Matt, 
he's at 18 and he knows yeah. all about it. And I said, oh, it was for Sega. He goes, it's not Sega, it's we. And uh, uh, so he'd be the one that I would have to go over to his house probably. And you invented killing somebody with a signpost and a tire? We did, um, we did a lot of sessions for this. Oh, really? Um, well, yeah, you were, you got called back quite a few oh, times. Oh my gosh. Right? Yeah, we were there dozens of times. Yeah, so how was that? Was it kind of like, you know, you'd see John and then, hey, see you in a couple weeks? Well, we, we did it a bunch, and then we came back and did it a bunch more. And some of the days were uh, eight-hour days, uh, which were fantastic because you can really get in the, uh, I think, the flow of it. Mm -hmm. um, doing it for just a couple of hours, I don't think you're able to, I mean, we would break. Uh, and where we, shot, where we recorded out in Burbank, there's a place called Chili John's down the road. And so eventually the excitement basically rested on what we're going to have for lunch that day. <laughs> uh, and then it would be chill. I think it was chili Thursdays or something like that. Okay. And the chili is uh, unspeakable. If you've ever been to Chili John's, uh, it's a really old school place and they do it on spaghetti, like Cincinnati style. Yeah, okay. Um, except I don't think they put a chocolate bar in the chili like Cincinnati people do, but um, there's really nothing like eating a giant lunch of chili. And then for some reason, like a lemon chiffon pie comes with it. Don't ask me why there's a combination <laughs> okay. of that. So I guess my advice is don't drink coffee after that because there's a lot of heartache. Um, so uh, that must have made the uh, the recording booth uh, have a lovely floral bouquet. Fortunately, John was separated from me by a wall of glass and a door. Oh really? We, we were we weren't in the same booth together because we needed the separation so we didn't crash uh -huh. each other because we were crashing each other anyway. Jack pretty much directed the whole thing and let us just jump on each other. So we try to get things clean, but a lot of the time we would just yell on top of each other. Uh -huh. uh, so he was, you know, through the other wall of the studio. And thank goodness, because there's a lot of things that emanate from John that are fairly unwholesome. <laughs> so <laughs> so how was it working with Jack? I, obviously, you've worked with him quite a bit before. Um, was this project, obviously, because of the content, a little bit different? Uh, yeah, it was. Um, I adore working with Jack because, uh, you know, he's a theater director and he does all kinds of theater. And over the course of his long asked career he's uh, directed shakespeare and uh, there's a cabaret in san francisco called um oh golly teatro campesini or some kooky that has fire eaters and you know this walk you know tightrope walkers and singing and you know this and that so he's directed basically everything you could direct uh, when i was at san francisco state back in the 40s um he directed there as well uh of the little theater there called brown bag and so He's really loose, and he has a fantastic sense of humor, mm -hmm. and we have a lot of the same references, uh, references that maybe some of the younger people might not get, old movie references and things yeah. like that. So we go, well, this one's like Karloff, or this one's like, you know, um, Peter Cushing in, you know, Dracula Rises from the Grave or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So how did that kind of translate into working on Mad World? Did your references, like, did, how did you build the character of Howard, because obviously it was on the page, but you definitely brought a, a very unique spin to uh, to Mr. Holmes. Well, I wasn't certain at the beginning uh, about all of Howard's givens, as we say in acting. Mm -hmm. For instance, the fact that one, he's an insane sexual pervert and would uh, yeah. pretty much go after anything that has a uterus uh, and is a biped, maybe not even a biped. I think a monoped might slip in there as well. And, and then, of course, the through line of that his, he has an ex-wife who he detests, who apparently counted around on him like no other woman has ever been slutty. And uh, those kept getting reinforced and reinforced and reinforced. And then the predilection for making crappy puns, which, of course, I loved, uh -huh. because I would anyway, even though I'm not a big punster. Uh, and the fact that uh, John's character, whose name has escaped me at the current... Uh, Chris Zepka. Yes. Chris, which Chris, which yeah, did... Chris. Uh, did um, I, I don't think anybody got the Kree Zabka reference. No. The Kree Zabka reference is, uh, I actually named the character, uh -huh. and it's a Karate Kid joke. Mm. Yeah, of course. John Kreese, and was the uh, was the name of the instructor. Wow. Now you tell and, me. Uh, and Zabka. Was All the this actor. time I've been laying up awake at night thinking, thinking what, what, oh, what was it? Yes, yeah. now I so know. So Kreese Zabka is a karate kid. Wow. Joke. And, you know, Kreese is just unrepentant scum. And, of course, he lived through playing Mad World, is the premise of the game. Yeah. But he's been through the human darts and every other uh, heinous manner of mayhem. And so. Uh, the fact that he threatened to kill me all the time, I thought, made it hilarious. Mm -hmm. uh, that the dynamic between two people who are sitting in a booth next to each other is that basically they detest each other. And secondly, that he, he's always threatening to kill me no matter what joke or horrible wordplay I made. And it was inevitable that I was going to make some sort of horrible wordplay off of whatever was going on. 
I, you know what it kind of reminded me of? And I don't know if people are going to get this, but it reminded me of anybody sitting next to Bill Walton. Ah, yeah. Bill Walton. Wow. Just saying, like, whatever insane, like, makes no sense yeah, thing yeah. he possibly could. And then somebody has to riff off that. Right. Right. And somebody has to come back and bring it to Earth. Yeah. After Bill Walton. And there were, like, there's lots of those where you're doing, like, the really bad pun. But then yeah. there's also lots of where he says just something completely out there. Yeah. And you're like, you were dropped on your head as a child. Yeah, yeah. Even, that I love, too, because it, it really is. It, it, it's like Crease was Bill Walton if Bill Walton had had to, you know, fight people with that were shooting ingots at his head through some bazooka or something all day long. Yeah. Bill Walton, that's so funny. Did, um... Oh, my God. How did, uh... How did you guys kind of... Did you feel the relationship, both as characters and as actors who were becoming friends, grow as you did these sessions? Absolutely. I think it got looser and looser and looser until it was so inconceivably vile at some points that we would just have the writers pounding their head on the table. That you would you would just hear their heads hitting the, the desk outside and oh. them laughing. And even um, when uh, uh, the people came in from Japan, some of whom spoke perfect English and some of whom didn't at all, I know that they thought it was funny anyway. Yeah. Um, which was very gratifying to be able to uh, be funny in another language that someone doesn't understand. Um, uh, yeah, John and I, you know, grew to like each other more and more, obviously. And uh, but uh, th th it was the uh, the level of sort of it, uh, no boundaries at a certain point where it would mm -hmm. just be heinous, and then we would hear them laugh, and then they might go, "Okay, okay, you know, we'll try to sell that one." A stunning sign smack from Jack. But yeah, it was you guys were slaying me on a daily basis. That's very gratifying. I'm glad to hear it. I mean, we were making each other laugh. And, and you know, I'm a comedian. So for me, the basic rule is always if it makes you laugh, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? I don't yeah. think you can think about the audience as much as uh, what's going on in the room mm -hmm. and then hope that it just translates for people. And I think it did. Yeah. Because I've been reading the reviews online and all the gaming mags and all the gaming blogs here and everybody seems to really enjoy that part, the announcing. Yeah. I mean, they like the music and the graphics, and obviously the visuals are stunning and the the, the fantastic stylization so that it's all in black and white with just the red, red. Yeah. The red, red Kravi, as Alex the Drig would say, uh, <laughs> just the blood is red. And um, But I think people really enjoy how, you know, kind of loose and horrible and profane the, the announcers were, too. It, it worked out brilliantly, yeah. I think. Um, what was your reaction to actually seeing the game? Well, I think it's fantastic. I mean... Uh, I, I, not being someone who plays a lot of games myself, not owning a Wii uh, device or whatever they're called, uh, I'm always kind of constantly astounded uh, how many people are involved in this and, and like whom, you know. Um, I would have thought it would be teenage boys, but I don't think it is. I think it's men in their 30s, you know, early 30s, late 20s. I think yeah. it's the real target audience for all this. Um, so... That's very interesting for me to find out that that's who's following all of these things, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't think women so much, but uh, I, I would have thought it was much a younger crowd mm -hmm. just uh, guessing that that it would be kids because teenagers are so computer savvy, so, so deft with everything, and they know how it works, and it's not a mystery to them. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you get to my age, you, like you say, you have to invite someone over to simply to get them to operate the machine for you. Well, I'm sure that you could actually have a good time playing Mad World just by yourself. Oh, yeah. But I was saying invite someone over just so you could relax and enjoy them. yourself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it's like, I have the nice surround sound system and I'm going to enjoy listening to myself. <laughs> how did them? How did the comedy, obviously, you know, as a comedian, you're writing your own material and you're working hard on that. And this, you know, you get these scripts coming from the Happy Tree Friends guys. Um, how did it kind of compare to your material how did you try to make it your own? Well, I would never, uh, I would never work <laughs> that dark because you you can't go in front of a live crowd in a comedy club and 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 uh, be quite as dark as you can on a video game. <coughs> the video game comes with its own reality, mm -hmm. so uh, staying true to the reality within the the framework of the game, like a like a movie, uh, is imperative. Uh, but riffing for me is is pure joy, and to have someone like John to bounce off of. So once you got the script, it was like just fun to be able to go wherever you wanted and and be able to swear and 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 say anything that came into my head, which is I think the the was the funnest part of doing the gig, which made it like I say, I, I, one I hate actors who complain that that work is hard because. If you've ever had a real job, like you've worked in a law office or anything like that, or mm -hmm. you know dug a coal mine or tried to raise a family, 
that's hard work. Yeah. Going into a studio and riffing with another alcoholic, not that hard of work. Yeah. Uh, so when I say that being there for eight hours was pure fun, it was pure fun. I didn't go, oh my God, it's five more hours. Because it went so quickly, and we were given sheaves of material, you know. Yeah. Because video games are unlike anything else I do. If I, I've done, I'm the voice of Bob the Builder also, or mm -hmm. used to be, for Project Build It, which is for two to four-year-olds. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. that's the cleanest, sweetest, nicest, most positive recycling thing in the world. And this is absolutely the obverse. This is the, the diametric opposite. Mm -hmm. This is Satan's version of, you know, Bob, Bob the Builder. The Builder. So Bob the Killer. Exactly. For, for me to do that, fantastic fun. Because with Bob the Builder, you read the lines, mm. and then we were done. Uh, and uh, you just tried to make sure you made sense of the lines. And uh, without doing too different of a voice, I mean, the, the, the Bob the Builder voice is my voice. When I do it, I'm, you know, hi, Jean-Pierre, well done. You know, that would be it. With Hank, I put a little more spin on it or whatever. And, but um, the freedom is what sex me up, you know, yeah, yeah. to be able to go in and have Jack at the Helms, which is like, you know, the insane people are in charge of the circus. So <laughs> it wasn't like he cracked the whip other than to get us to shut the up sometimes and get back to the script. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, I've heard your baseball story oh, yeah, when yeah. you were guys just, you know, waiting around between takes. Well, John's from New York and uh, I always called him number five because his name's DiMaggio, right? Yeah. And uh, that was DiMaggio's number. And, uh, and I'm from San Francisco and Jack is a huge... Giants from from San Francisco as well, so we're kind of sick with it. So yeah, it would end up being talking about sports or a lot of times music. Uh, all of a sudden, out of nowhere, we'd be doing a bit, and all of a sudden, John would play like James Brown from some live concert over his iPhone that he had downloaded off some cocking thing, and yeah. he, he he's deep into music. So and so is Jack, and we would all go into that too. And uh, so, frankly, we stole a lot of money from the Sega people because we about it probably more than we should, but we did get it all done in the end. Awesome. <laughs> Well, I think you guys you guys pulled off something really special. Um, Thank you, Jean Pierre. Even even though you know a game announcing, it's really hard just from a technical standpoint because you've only got a limited number of lines, and then there's all these situations, and sometimes it repeats itself. But oh, yeah. I don't think you guys get old in this game. Well, that's very kind of you. And I think, and not just because you know the game is is beating me right now. Mm. But I, I, it was really special. I think Nishikawa San's idea of having announcers in the game was brilliant for this kind of game, and the spin that you guys put on it was just absolutely excellent. So yeah, thank you very much. For thank you. I can see you're trying to wind it up here, but I wanted to make one more long-winded point. No, uh, well, you can make a long-winded point, and I'm going to let you plug and talk about comedy here. In a oh, okay. The, the, uh, being able to do, uh, you, because of the repetition of doing a video game, you're given a sheaf of paper, and sometimes it's, obviously, it's important to get all the rules in and get all the what's going to happen now and the parameters so that the gamer knows what's going on. Uh, and that's what makes it different than doing movies or cartoons or voiceover or acting or stand-up or anything. You're forced to go back to the same lines over and over again and try to do something with it. Yeah. Excuse me. And we were given the leeway to goof around at all times. So uh, that was sort of the challenge, but that's what made it fun too. And also having DiMaggio there um, because he's going to go with the flow, and and me as well. If he would start something, I'd do it, and we would just pick up on each other all the time, uh, which made it 20 times funner than going in. I've done them uh, when you go in by yourself, and you just read it, and they'll go, well, just riff if you want, and then you riff, and they go, just read the script, you know what I mean? Yeah, like yeah, the, yeah. Immediately, that's gone, because they'll, you'll do too much, or you'll go off the beaten path, and they don't want that. They simply want you to go, Level three means pick the red button if you wish to continue. And I don't think we were bound by that at all, other than saying this is where we kill hookers or this is where the you know, the, <laughs> the ghostly and, and, yeah. sluts come out and you kill them with arrows or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, it's so surreal to describe the situations in our game. Yeah. It's like, you know, a standard game, this is when you kill an enemy. This is when you strap a, you know shove a tire over a fat woman with enormous breasts yeah. and then, you know, beat her around a cathedral. Yes. Like, it just becomes more obscene yeah. and more surreal. Yeah. I can imagine you guys getting the the, the slugs of what this was going to be for. And you'd be like, what? Yeah, we would laugh our ass off because it would say, like, but just that, you yeah. know, hookers, you know, get cut into, put bag over hookers' head, bounce around. And sometimes, fantastically, 
in stilted reconstituted English. Oh, so God. it would be like reading. That was that was not my fault. No, I know. That I know. was not my but, fault. You know, go go time fun thing good yeah. there. You know, and you'd be like crying laughing and then uh, so yeah. Anyway, it was it 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 fit in with me being a stand up because I tend to riff as a stand up and I do a lot of improv. So I really enjoyed that part. Uh, I don't like a lot. What I like is some rules because mm -hmm. some rules gives you the structure to be able to build something. Mm -hmm. I find that uh, one of the big lies about everything is uh, do what you want because do what you want is a mess. Yeah. And uh, there has to be direction and there has to be, um, you know, guidelines. Mm -hmm. But within those guidelines, you can, there's a whole world. Um, you know, like like Islamic art or whatever. People go, oh, isn't it constricted because you can't use figures or you can't use faces and whatnot? Yeah. No. It, it's simply, uh, you know, the parameters are set and therefore within that there's an you infinite work within, world. Yeah, yeah, work within your four walls. I, I, think that, I think that makes for good uh, creativity and good, I, I hesitate to use the word art, but certainly craft, you know. Mm -hmm. Um when anybody ever says do what you want or there's no limits or this and that, I tend to find that it, 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 it's a bit of a, if you'll pardon the expression, uh, masturbatory because you can, you, you just, you're getting yourself off and nobody else. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the duty is to, you've got an audience and the audience has to respond to what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And if you're just rambling or rattling, not so good. When there's, you know, yeah. I mean, that's why stand up for works for me. Mm -hmm. you're trying to get a laugh every 15 to 30 seconds. So the rules are written. Mm -hmm. No matter what you're talking about, you still have to come back to laugh lines and punch lines that are going to spur the audience on. Did, uh, just to hit up uh, something that I think you probably know best for, which is the Who's Line stuff. Sure. Did any of the Who's Line stuff kind of make it into Mad World? Did you slip something in that, that uh, people might have missed? Well, not that I can remember off the top of my head, but I'm certain it did. Uh, we had so many riffs that we did a thousand times on that <coughs> show. Um, and, you know, again, with those guys, people would say to us, D did you guys really make it up? Which is a left-handed compliment, right? Yeah. It's a, it's a compliment in so much as they think, oh, well, it had to have been written because well, how could you possibly be so clever as to think of those dick jokes? But <laughs> uh, by the same token, we've been doing it a long time and we work together a lot and we've known each other. Uh, I I've known all the Who's Line guys for, God, we're on to 20 years now almost. In fact, it'll be 20 years this year. Wow. And um, after you work with someone that long, you know what they're going to do. And I think that's the reason why people liked Who's Line so much, that it was slightly unsafe and unpredictable. Uh, it was a regular network television show, and it was in England for 10 years before that, and I did the whole thing. But we really didn't know what we were going to say. And sometimes you'd say something so f***ed up and weird that everybody had to go with it, and we would make it work. And you just don't get that in scripted shows. And if you would ever let network executives decide what's going to happen, they're going to homogenize it to the point where there's nothing good ever. Yeah. Because they simply, they, people who run networks don't do their own laundry. They mm -hmm. don't raise their own children. They have nannies. They don't wash their own car. They don't go to the post office. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. They don't have lives. Your life is going to the grocery store. Your, your life isn't sending someone to do everything for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So then I read a quote the other day from one of the network execs because they're making more sitcoms this year. Yeah. People want sitcoms because of the economic downturn. Yeah. People are depressed. Like, And you hey, know that there's a meeting of like 80 guys yes. who came up with that. Hey, dad, catch a wave. It's <laughs> been this way for two years. Oh, and the other part of the quote was, you know, after 9-11, everybody really wanted reality. It was like, honey, no one ever wanted anything that you people shoved up our ass. Yeah. People want entertainment. They want stories. They want action. They want whatever. They want to feel something. Yeah, exactly. And it feels like the TV, particularly, and, and big movies, you know, big, yeah, big budget type movies, are trying to keep you from feeling things, which is, I think, why people love independent things so much and why... Why independent films took over the Oscars in the last 10 years. And why a picture like Slumdog Millionaire out of nowhere, which would have never been nominated for an Oscar 15, 20 yeah. years ago. That would have been best foreign film shunted. Yeah, it shunted, would have been a shunted. Bollywood, if, if even if it would have gotten any respect as a Bollywood movie to begin with. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think that's the, the, the big upshot of it is the, the interweb. And uh, uh, that's the positive part of it. The negative part is that it detaches people because they spend too much time on their, alone on their computer or on their game. But the positive part is that there's an independent world where everyone is empowered now. 
And also the idea of feeling something and interacting with other people in that world is important. And I think that's the, the, the best thing that's happened out of all of this. So we've only got a, like a minute left. Yeah, I'm, uh, I could blather for a minute. Oh, it's all right. It's all right. I, and I would love to indulge it. But I just want to ask you one last thing. Is that, uh, What are you working on now? Uh, I have a chat show that I do over at a place called Largo in La Cienega in Los Angeles. I know your pod people might be here. And of course, I do my stand-up. I'm on Nickelodeon for you young children that are watching <laughs> on a show called True Jackson VP. That's on Saturday nights. And uh, and I'm on Flight of the Concords, which I think they're showing ad nauseum on HBO. Yes, they do yes. air that quite often. I play an advertising asshole as if there was another kind of person in advertising. Well, Mad Men. Ah, Mad Men. There you yeah. go. Um, and obviously all your old material lives on on YouTube. It lives on forever and ever, and whose line? Uh, we might be doing something I can't really talk about it. Drew's trying to whip up some improv thing, uh, and also um, I, I'm going to have an album coming out this year called Elsewhere on a, a special thing uh, label, which you can go on the web and find. It's the same level as um, uh, Doug, Doug Benson's on it, Brian Vassane, a lot of guys, so cool. I made a new album there. Excellent. Thank and I you. call it an album because I'm old. Thank <laughs> you very much for joining us. Thank you, Jim. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure, pal. Great. Thank you very much. Cheers. <laughs>